All of God people said. Say it again. One more time like you believe it. <sighs> Give me a moment. You stand with me. Today we'll be coming from 2 Samuel, chapter 6. Should be a story that y'all all for all are familiar with. And we're going to jump down to verse 20. 2 Samuel, chapter 6, starting at verse 20. When you got it, say amen. If you can see it, say amen. And if you want to get it for yourself, say wait. I'll wait on this. And forgive me because I got a malfunctioning equipment. So if it start talking to you, don't. There we go. My goodness. Second Samuel chapter six, starting at verse twenty, it reads this way. When David returned home to bless his house, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel disgusted himself today disrobing in the sight of his slave girls and of the fellow servants in a vulgar, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone of your, from your house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes but the, the slave girls you spoke of I will be held in honor and Michael had the Saul, daughter of Saul had no children until the day of her death if you don't mind I want to preach from this unique topic of the gospel according to Bobby Brown with pen this song it's my prerogative So as we look at this scripture, we can see that here it is, a man of God has just came home from celebrating. And if you know the story, David was just celebrating because the ark of the Lord was in its rightful place. Because of the fact David was in his own mind already upset with God because of the fact of you, one of the servants touched the ark of God and died, so David sent it away. Now, David realized that the blessing was on the house that he sent it to, which was Obed-Edom. And now David was like, wait a minute, that blessing should have been here all along. So now on the way he's going, he went to get it. And as he's coming back home, he's celebrating and praising God. But yet, as soon as he gets home... He's met at the door with negativity. It, it, it blows my mind that as soon as we get done praising God and we be in, we be having a high time. The minute we leave here, we met with negativity because of the way that we so choose to praise God and how we want to act. So in this, we see that Michael is already upset with the man that she so loved. You do remember that she was so madly in love with David and Saul tried to use it for his own good. Y'all don't want to talk. I tell the story myself. Y'all do realize the only reason that Saul was so giving to give Michael to David was he wanted to trap him and get him killed. So what, again, was meant for evil can be got to turn that thing around. It can be meant for your good. So here we are. David is praising God. He is excited on fire. His wife is telling him, 
you need to act like you've been here before. How many of us have been caught up in the spirit and the person sitting next to us don't like for the way that we praise him because we too loud, we didn't jumped over them, and yet they're saying, act like you've been here before. My mama used to tell me, act like you got some daggone sense and sit your butt down. But then when you realize something, you acting like you got some sense, but yet and still when you was in the world, you act like you didn't have no sense, and God still protected you while you was out there. So you want to get in here and act dignified and sedity, and I'm going to say be stupid if you want to, but I'm going to sit back and praise God like I've been here before. So with that, we see that she was upset because she seemed it as shameful behavior. How is it that when you get caught up worshiping God, people judge you about the way that you do it? You may throw your head back and shout. You may sit down and cry. You may hug yourself. But people are upset about the way that you praise. And I'm, I come by to tell you, if you're upset about it, something is wrong because you shouldn't be watching me. You should be seeing what I'm praising about. Y'all, y'all ain't going to talk to me, so I'll talk to myself. She was upset because it was shameful behavior on her part. And some of the ladies can say this. My daddy didn't act like that. Mm. Your daddy didn't act like that. So now we're getting to comparing me to your daddy, but yet and still I was chosen over your daddy. Y'all don't even get that? It says it, in, it says it in the next scripture. See, that's why I'm glad God made me write this down because he knew my computer was going to act up. So it says it in the scripture. It said when David replied to her, it said the Lord chose me over your father and your whole house, which means I ain't got to act like your daddy. There was a reason why I was put here in the first place. You got to be careful with people trying to quiet your praise because they don't know what you've been through. You do realize that David was chosen over his brothers and he wasn't even brought up to the lineup. In, in 1 Samuel 16 through 10, it said that David was anointed. Now watch it. His brothers was brought forth. There were seven of them. Each one had a different characteristic than the other. And yet still, when Samuel was going to a anoint them and said, God said, no, that's not who I chose. And he said, is there another among you that has not been here? Oh, the one that's back there working? The forgotten one? And it says that we will not sit down until he's brought up. Be careful of people trying to quiet your praise because, again, you may be anointed to take this to the next level. And you can't take it to the next level sitting down or letting people tell you how, what, and when you're supposed to do something. That's why I love the song about this because here it is, Bobby Brown. Y'all know Bobby Brown. Y'all know he crazy as all get out. But Bobby Brown had to make a decision. Stay a part of New Edition and suffer or branch out on his own and be happy. Don't want to say amen. Look it up yourself. They talked about Bobby Brown because he was part of a a Grammy-nominated group. They was doing big things, but yet and still there was stuff going on behind closed doors that either A, he was a part of and was trying to get out of, B, he just don't want to do it anymore, or all the above. We'll never know. That's between him and New Edition. But yet and still, they talked about him, and this song was to tell people, look, This is my own thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live the way I want to live. It's in the lyrics. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my prerogative. I'm going to live my life. It's mine. And then he went on that mind. I ain't going to go that far. But you know, it was his prerogative. So I come to ask you this question. Is it your prerogative to praise God? If it is, then how are you going to let somebody else stop you? Because of the simple fact of, before I was here, you couldn't tell me I didn't look good. You still can't tell me. I can come up here looking like I do now and tell you right now, y'all better be lucky I'm married. 
And my wife would be like, go on, baby. I know she's sitting back looking like, shut up, but go on, baby. But think of it like this. When we was out in the world, we didn't care how we looked. We didn't care what we did. If we got downright dirty, we got downright dirty. We got our hands dirty. We did our work. And then we get saved, and we want to be dignified. Praise God. I'm not going to shout and scream. I'm going to sit back. And I'm going to let the glory of the Lord follow me. And I'm not going to show any signs of it following. I'm going to look to my left and see that my brother is praising God. But I'm going to sit back and be like this. Amen. And then we realize why a lot of us have missed out on our blessings. There have been stuff that God told us to go do. And we yet figure out, well, why we can't do it? Because you ain't first acknowledged the fact that the presence of God is in the building. <laughs> or you just want to be plumb dumb and just be like, well, God, you ain't done nothing for me this week. And if you understand something, Enrichment hour starts at 9 o'clock. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something that we learned in enrichment hour today, and if you want to go back and watch it, you can. You got to be able to praise God for your past experiences. Yeah. Here David is not praising God for what only he's done. He's praising him for what the past is, considering the fact that your daddy tried to kill me, Michael, yet and still he never was able to. Your daddy tried to set me up to get me killed by giving me you thinking that it'll distract me, but didn't realize that the hand of God was on me. I come by to tell somebody today, be careful of letting somebody tell you the hand of God is not on you, considering the fact that they're jealous of you. Understand this. He's praising God, and it's not just for what he's seeing, but what he's yet to see. Now, take a moment. Take a moment. Listen. How many of y'all can praise God for the blessings that he's promised you that you have yet to see. See, we, we, we talked about the past, and like I said, he was praising God. He's like, you chose me out of my seven brothers. You kept Saul from trying to kill me, not once but twice, but trying to set me up again. Your hand was on me when I had to kill Goliath, and you brought me through all of this. And yet and still, the only thing that I can give back to you is my praise and my worship. I would be a fool to let somebody stop me. All right, so, again, are you going to be that fool and act like you got some daggone sense and sit there? Guess what? If I'm sitting next to somebody... And the presence of God falls on them. Doesn't that mean he's on the same road that you are? And the beauty behind it is while he's sitting next to Margaret Harris, he could be sitting next to Reverend Williams right now. While he's sitting next to them two, he could be at the back of the room touching Brooklyn, wherever she at. Do you not understand the, the experience that you get when the presence of God falls on you? And then... How are you able to move differently? Again, you can't move differently without it. You can move, but you ain't going to move differently. I, again, I, we moving right along. Like I said, I, I ain't going to be before you alone. I just want you to get this in there. Again, it's... William Murphy sings a song. Praise is what I do. When I want to be close to you. Am I missing something? It says praise is what. Did it say praise is what me and a manny do? Did it say when a choir gets up, I'm going to join in and praise and worship? 
They say when pastor or whoever's up here preaching, I'm going to join in because of it's no praise is what I do. Praise it should be when you on your way here. Matter of fact, when you roll over out of your bed and your two feet hit the ground, however it do, that's when you should start praising and worshiping because somebody didn't make it today. So if praise is what I do. Why are you trying to wait until somebody next to you do it? Hmm. Again, it's what I do. And guess what? At this point in my life, I got some people here that grew up with me. They're going to laugh when I tell you this. I used to be that angry person that if you see me cry, it came like this. Guess what? I don't care. At this point in my life, I realized that growing up on 3010 East 24th Street, where I should have been part of a gang, I wasn't. Growing up in that neighborhood where there were gunshots all around the house, but no stray bullet went through the house. Knowing that I was brought up in what is quote unquote a broken home, but yet and still, I'm here. Having a baby at 14 when you would have threw me away, but God said, nah, nah, little man, I got something for you. Excuse me, I'm going to talk about myself for a minute. Having kids when I shouldn't have been, and yet still God said, nah, you might be trying to do this on purpose, but I still come closer, come closer. Being able to be an example not only to my house, but to other people, and letting you know, hey, I didn't do this by myself. It's nothing but the grace of God that I'm able to stand here right now and be like this. I made it. So excuse me for praising God the way that I so choose because, again, the song that says praise is what I do. And I'm going to get close to him whether you like it or not. But you also should be careful of talking about the man of God or the people of God because there is a punishment for when you talk about the people of God or the man of God that some of y'all are dealing with right now because you keep talking about people and wondering why you sick. Wondering why you can't get none of the blessings that you have in store for you because you don't know the art of shutting up. You can't, you can't say amen, say ouch, because some, some of us don't understand the art of shutting up and listening. Otherwise, we just talk too much. And then when you talk too much, you sound about as ignorant as Michael do when you start judging people about their praise and their worship. <sighs> you do realize. It, it, it. Don't believe me. Let me let me put scripture on it. You do realize Miriam mocked Moses for having a wife that wasn't part of their tribe. She was stricken with leprosy. Cora and the followers was trying to lead people against Moses, swallowed by the earth. Hannah did something contrary to Jeremiah's prophets, and she died two months later. I can't pronounce this word, but she cursed and threw stones at David, and she was executed, get this, by David's son Solomon. Guess what? If that's not good enough, the Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Or touch not the people of God and do my prophets no harm. Again, learn the art of shutting your daggum mouth. And if you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say nothing to me at all. And understand that prayer works better than you talking about me. But if you choose to talk about me, understand this. I'm walking in the light that God gave me. So if you're going to talk about me, understand if any of, the, any of these things happen to you, it ain't my fault. Because it ain't like I'm going to sit here and pray, God, get my enemies. No. Being Christian-minded, we should be praying for our enemies and saying, in spite of what they're doing to me, please have mercy on them. Because if you can't do that, I'm going to tell you this right now. Be careful of saying, oh, I forgive you, but I won't forget. Shut up. That's the dumbest thing you could ever say. If you forgive me, you will forget. Now, that don't mean we have to associate ourselves with each other. 
Forgiveness doesn't mean I'm going to hang around with you. Forgiveness is just that I forgive you, not for you, but for me. Because, again, if it had not been for God that showed me grace and mercy, where would I be? I love this because this this is, oh, again, I'm sorry, this is, let me talk to y'all for a minute. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about praising God for your past. And I asked them a question. What has God done for you? We're so quick to jump to, well, God sent his only begotten son to die for me. And guess what? That's a good church answer. What has God done for you? Where has he brought you out of? Where has he taken you away from? Some of us won't raise our hand and say we battle alcoholism and drugs, but yet and still God brought us back. Some of us won't say we were some hoes out there and they brought us back. I'm not talking about nothing. I'm only talking about stuff that I know. So if I'm going down your lane, don't take it up with me. So, again, how many of us can understand and be like, hey, God brought me through this from my past to tell you about my present for y'all to be excited with me about my future? Some of us wouldn't have been married if you knew our past. Some of y'all wouldn't let us around your kids if you knew our past. Some of us are so judgmental and act like we've never done anything wrong. We're like the city. Praise God, hallelujah. First, give an honor to God who is the head of my life. We want to give these church answers, but I need you to pull out. God came and got me out of a crack house. Let me tell somebody how I got there. Matter of fact, there might be somebody here who needs to hear this. And if you're not walking right, you can't talk right. And you can't walk right and talk right without being Christ-like. See, these are the things you got to be able to share with people and not give them that whole come to my church. No, nah, you are the church and you should be able to address their needs where they're at. What's the point of saying, hey, pray for me. I'm going to pray for you when I get home. You missed your blessing right there because there might be something that you need to minister to. I'm, 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 I'm still in my word because it's my prerogative to tell you this. I'm still right there in there. So get this. If you don't hear me, we got to get so far away from what people think about us. And get out of here and go out there. And despite of what people think about us, we're still delivering what is on the inside of us. Because, again, how do we get, how are we supposed to disciple people if we're not talking to people? Yes, his own wife didn't understand his worship. She's supposed to be, she's supposed to be right in line. She knew the God that they serve. His own wife. Some of us are sitting next to people right now that won't understand us, nothing about us, how we do things, why we do things, where we came from, how we got here. And guess what? Some of us ain't meant to. But is it, but is it authentic in your worship? Because if it's not, there's going to be a time where you can't play church no more. There's going to be a time where you ain't, you, I'll take that back, you ain't going to have enough time to get it right. Because once it's done, it's done. And death, there is no reverse button. We're practicing down here so that when we get up there. But you can't practice down here 
if you judging, if you won't listen, i.e. shut your mouth, or if you always talking about somebody. And if you can't say amen to those three things, you might be one of them. You might be talking about a man of God. No, it's not just a man of God. It's man of God. And it's not just a person of God. It's people of God. Understand this. If you talk about a kid who's trying to get their life right, you're talking about people of God. You're talking about somebody that belongs to him. And, if, again, if you're not going to talk about them, my kids will tell you this. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, shut up. That's a lesson that all of us have learned as kids. And some of us need to go back to teaching our kids that. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, if you ain't got, if you want to be dignified in your answer and want to be sit on the back row and all you want to do is just sit back there and look and then when the benediction is given, get up, by all means, bless your heart. We'll continue praying for you. But I need to talk to people who have that authentic relationship with God that understand that if it had not been for him, who was on my side, carrying me back and forth. I might not be here. I should have been dead. There should have been a stray bullet that hit the house and should have went for Sean's head. But it was by the grace of God that it didn't. There was parties that I've been at that that got shot up, but I walked out. There's clubs that I've been at to where I seen the person pull the gun out in front of my car. And guess what? Did nothing was pointed at me. Did nothing hit the car or the people that was in. You can't tell me that ain't nothing but God. And if you can't tell me something different, guess what? Get behind me, Satan. This ain't nothing to play with no more. We get we got to get out of this whole traditional thing of playing church and letting people stop what we have to do. In other words, we got to get out of these four consecrated walls, go out there, and in spite of people saying it don't take all that to worship. When you get your breakthrough, you'll understand where I came from. And then we got to go out and talk to people and be able to listen to their story and not one-up them and say, I relate to you. I've been there. Let me tell you how I got out. And then if they don't understand it, guess what? Shake the dust from your feet and walk away. I just want to thank Sean for that message. Because the words say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Maybe you don't think he's done nothing for you. But maybe your neighbor next to you been through hell and high water. And God brought him through a storm. And when he did bring him out of that storm, they had some rejoicing to do. Because they know the doctors didn't do it. The nurse didn't do it. The medicine didn't do it. I just want you to reflect on how good God is. A year ago, I caught the COVID, and it almost took me out of here. For five weeks, I didn't even know I was in the world. And then when I came back to myself, I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't think. I still have relapses. I still have side effects from the COVID today. But you know, God got a way of bringing us back to himself. I came back for two Sundays, and it knocked me back out. Satan was still trying to seek and destroy those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I promise the Lord one thing, I'll serve him till I die. I may not have been there, but I still made phone calls. I still prayed on the line the best I could. I was still in the ministry of the Lord because I said, Lord, order my steps in your word. Whatever it is you want me to do, give me the strength. But Sean said one thing if you don't leave here with nothing else, that Maybe you just haven't been where I've been. 
But think about this. If God didn't wake you up this morning, you wouldn't be here. If he didn't order your body to wake up, you couldn't touch the ground. Some of us out here is hurting bad, and, and, and they don't tell nobody. They keep a secret. That's all right, as long as you're giving it to the one that can fix it. But don't go through life holding back those things that you can't change. You can't change nothing. You can't change the color of your hair. I don't care how much dye you put in, when it grow out, it's still going to be gray. Or whatever color it was when God gave it to you. So we need to come to realization that Jesus loves us all. He loves us. And he loves us differently from one another. Because he knows he didn't make no robots. He knows what each one of his children need when they need it. I may not need what you need or you need what I need, but God's going to meet your needs according to his richness and glory. Sean, preach. Keep preaching. The more you preach, the more you grow. Tell the story. Get up, speak up, shut up, and sit down. Don't add to and don't take away. If God tell you to say it, it must somebody out there need to hear it. It was times I wanted to hold back and say, Lord, I, I don't want to say that. He said, look where I brought you from. You could have been dead. But look where I brought you from. Somebody else need that same revelation that I gave you to hear that what he done for me, he'll do for others. I told this, and if some people don't know me. I'm Reverend Williams. I've been gone over a year. But I just got to tell this one more time. And then I'm going to open the doors of the church. You know, when you're at your lowest, and you can't, don't feel you can go no further. God always got a ram in the bush. Always. I, I was sick, and everybody came in my room. My wife was there every day. Nobody caught the COVID for me because it was for me. That was my lesson. That was my whooping, and I had to go through it all by myself. For five weeks, I didn't know I was in the world. But my wife kept telling me. I would laugh out loud. Uh, I, I, I'd see things, and i just bust out. And when I could see something, I'd, the last thing I remember was my sister-in-law and my granddaughter coming to see me. And they said, we're going to pray for you. And when I woke up, I, I said, did they go to the mountain? In all I saw in my vision was they said, we're going to the mountain to pray for you. And I asked my wife, did y'all go to the mountain? That's how baffled I was. Al came to see me, and, and I'm going to tell it again. Al came to see me. Al looked at me, and my brother-in-law had just passed. brother-in-law had just passed and Al walked in the room and looked at me and I guess I looked like death too and he was standing over there almost about to cry and and I looked up at me and said well I'm gonna pray for you brother and then I gotta go he prayed for me and he went to go out the door he was so low in spirit the Lord said now give Al some joy I said hey brother it's one thing I want you to do for me before you go he said anything man anything I said, man, give me one of them smiles you got. I said, because I need some joy. And he bust out laughing, and, and he forgot why he came. You know, sometimes it ain't me blessing you or you blessing me. Sometimes God bless us both. Yeah. And he know I'm going to say it forever because, boy, when he left, he had some joy, and I had some too. I still didn't know I was in all there. And I'm still not there yet. But God is working on me. But if you don't see me some Sunday, I'm still a part of New Hope. I still send my tithes, my offering. 
I've had surgery. I can't use this hand. I've got numbness in one foot, but it's all right. Amen. I'm going to serve him until I die. Amen. There may be somebody here today that needs to know about this Jesus that we serve. He's a brother. Yes. He's a friend. He's a confidant. But most of all, he's our Lord and Savior. Yes. There's nobody can do you like Jesus. Amen. Nobody. Nobody. So when you're at your lowest, kneel on down since you're already down there and have a little talk with Jesus.